Interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin, please be seated. I have a few housekeeping notes to make before we begin today's program. Firstly, I would like to seek your cooperation in completing the evaluation form, which is available in the welcome folder. Kindly com submit the completed form at the registration counter at the end of the program. Kindly switch your mobile phones and pages to the silent mode. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Hong Kong Xi'an University, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you will find this event to be fruitful and engaging. We now invite Professor David Yuan, Head of Department of Business Administration of Hong Kong Xi'an University, to deliver the welcome mes uh, message. Professor Yuan, please. Professor Ranga Krishna, project members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome every one of you to this public lecture. It is, uh, our, it is our great honor to have a world-renowned scholar, Professor Ranga Krishna, to be our invited speaker in today's brain-based teaching and learning series. This public, lecture, this public lecture series is part of a three-year institutional development scheme entitled Constructing an Interdisciplinary Research Platform at Hong Kong Xi'an University, supported by the Research Grant Council of the Hong Kong SAL government. By means of this interdisciplinary research platform, Xi'an strive to facilitate a cross-fertilization of thoughts from the East and from the West, and to give our academics a competitive research edge in this era of globalization. Hmm. Professor Krishna is a world-renowned expert on psychiatry and behavioral sciences. He is currently the Dean of Duke NUS Graduate Medical School, Singapore. He was the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University in North Carolina for 11 years until 2009. Professor Krishnan has published extensively and received many highly prestigious awards, including the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry. C. Charles Burlingame Award and the Award for Research in Geriatric Psychiatry from the American College of Psychiatrists. <clears throat> in addition, he has also devoted himself to the promotion of higher education through integrating new technologies into methods of effective teaching and learning. Today's public lecture by Professor Krishna is on learning for tomorrow, a topic that all of us would very much look forward to learning more about. Professor Krishna, please. Thank you, Professor Yan. And uh, Professor Yan, please remain on the stage. I would like to invite Hong Kong Xi University Director of Graduate Studies, Professor Brewers Joffrey, to come on stage together with Professor Professor Yuan to present a souvenir to our guest of honor, Professor Ranga Krishnan. I would also like to invite our guest of honor, Professor Ranga Krishnan, to come on stage and receive the souvenir. Professor Krishnan and Professor <laughs> Boris, Professor Yuan, please. The souvenir is a handmade card with a 3D Xi'an building in the middle, representing research collaboration start at the Xi'an University. Professor, please remain on the stage. I now invite all the IDS project members to come on the stage and take a group photo.
Thank you very much. Please be seated. It is now my pleasure to invite Professor Ranga Krishnan to share with us a public lecture topic, Learning for Tomorrow. Professor Krishnan, please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. For those of you who were there this morning, some of this will be repetition, but repetition is good. So what I'm going to try doing is sort of give you a, can you hear me okay? Okay. So what I'm going to do is give you a basic sense of uh, what learning is and what the rules of learning are and a little bit of how we applied those rules in Singapore. So that will be the context of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so. Before I get into it, I want to make sure that you, uh, the clarity of what I'm going to talk about is anytime you want to talk about something, you want to be very clear what is it you're going to talk about. So there are three things I'm going to talk about. First is learning about the science of learning. And I'm not going to get into the depth of it because that would not be possible in the time frame. Second is frame the rules and what, how to learn the rules of learning. And third, is learn how to apply those rules to what you would do in a university or school. Now, one of the interesting things about um, learning nowadays, and there's a lot of interest in this topic for the last several years, is what's happening to the workforce. So the workforce around the globe is getting into something people are calling the donut. One, the donut is a big hole in the middle, and that hole is getting bigger. And there is one side, which is a really, really bright people, you don't need to do anything, they're going to do fine. And then you've got the other side where people really know how to use their hands and to make things. And the big middle is what computer systems and our networks are gradually beginning to replace. And that is a real problem around the globe because common cognitive skills, thinking skills, as well as the storage of knowledge are all becoming distributed and most important, all of you have mobile phones. It's accessible to you anytime, anywhere, any place. So that has got some profound implications for what the core skills need to be and how do we train and maintain a place which can give employment to as many people as you can globally. So where education and learning comes in is how to make that donut the hole in the donut smaller so that you have more people having the ability to work in this new world. So the OECD talks about seven odd skills. The most important one is literacy. And literacy basically refers to not what we generally think of as read and write. Now read and write at its basic level is fine, but you're actually talking about the ability to take what you're reading, interpret, extend, and apply. And that is true for the other skill, which is numeracy, counting. Now, numeracy, normally we think of it as just math, but it's more than math. In, in fact, it's a lot more than math. And numerate behavior, again, means using numbers in context and applying it to what you need to solve problems. And it also includes various other elements, including literacy. And it connects to the next important uh, piece, which I'll get into one second. Um, with regard to counting numbers, we always think of it as a totally human phenomenon. Math, in the way we think of, is human. But counting extends into animals. Pigeons, monkeys, rabbits, rats, you can show. And how do we know that? If you take an experiment and you show one object, two objects, three objects, four objects, and you can see how animals react to it, animals can react depending on the number of objects, roughly up to between three to five, most often four. Beyond that, it's lot or less. And in fact, babies also do the same way. They can react up to small numbers. Large numbers is just large versus small. So this happens in a very tiny piece of the brain. Right around here, on both sides, it's called the intraparietal sulcus. If that area gets damaged, and in a small percentage of the population, 
this part of the brain doesn't seem to work as well, they have trouble with numbers, and it's called dyscalculia. And the question that we don't know is we can identify these kids very, very early now, but what do we do with them? We don't know. And in fact, people are trying to build solutions for it, but it's not one that is easily solved yet. Now, this gets into the next thing. So using literacy and numeracy, you need to be able to solve problems in this new world. In the old world, to solve something, you needed to keep inside your brain. In, this, in the current world that you're already in, how many of you remember telephone numbers of all your friends? Anybody? No one. Okay, that's interesting. If I'd asked the same thing 10 years ago, five years ago, you, many of you would have because you didn't have a choice. Otherwise, you had to write a piece of paper, keep it around you all the time. Now, you don't even think about it. It's already stored. Okay, and if you don't store it, you know where to find it. Just think of how that has profoundly changed how we use information, how you memorize, etc. In this new world, most content is accessible, geographically dispersed, time dispersed, and therefore anytime, anywhere, any place. So therefore, the most important skill is not what you kept in your head, but how you can find what you need, when you need it, and most important, apply it. That's called problem solving. Not a skill that traditionally schools and universities are focused on, because they focused on an era that has come to an end. I'm not even talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about today. That era has basically come to an end. And it has come to an end because you can use information anytime, anywhere, any place, if you know how to use it. Which brings up one thing which is very, very key, that many parts of the brain are engaged in this, and the part of the brain that we know that is very important for this is in the front end of the brain called the anterior cingulate. And in the anterior cingulate, now when I'm talking to you, I'm focused on one thing, but if I was a mathematician, then I actually have to think in a very large way. So the attention is focused but broad. When you have focused and broad attention, that is when you're able to pull things from something else and put it together with something else and you create new things. That seems to involve the anterior cingulate. The other important aspect of today's life in terms of work is very rare that you can do things by yourself. Teams and teamwork has become very critical for all kinds of jobs. So this means communication. But most important about communication is that it is not just talking, like what I'm doing, but it's also listening. And also looking at somebody and trying to figure out what is it they're really trying to say, not it is, not what they're verbally saying. And that, by the way, is not a skill that is there anymore because you go to, I don't know how Hong Kong is, but in Singapore, everybody is on their little pads and the other person is across. I'm not even sure that they may be messaging each other, but they're not talking to each other. Okay, and I see this more and more because communication and the tools of communication have changed. But the real world, if you're working together, you better need, you need to know how to talk, how to understand what the other person is really saying to you how to be able to provide, convey information. And a very important tool is learning that learning doesn't finish when you finish school. Learning is lifelong. In the current workforce globally, most people have to change jobs all the time, every few years. If you change jobs, you may have to get new skills. New skills, learning. Which brings up the most important aspect of this is the ability to manage yourself. It's called self-management, very critical skill, and this skill includes managing time, how to make choices or decisions, which I understand will be part of the same collaborative uh, presentations in the future, learning how to keep on your task, and equally important, having a goal. You need to know where in the world you want to go. If you don't know where you want to go, then you may not know when you get there, and you don't know how to get there either. So all this boils down to learning li through life. Now, this almost makes it seem like this is something new. It isn't. When I'm talking to you, from the minute you were born, actually from the second you were born, all of us were built to learn. Our brains are constantly learning. That is different from what we commonly call learning, which is formal learning. Formal learning is a tiny part of your real learning which happens right through life. The real learning is what leads to habits, 
what leads to good things, what leads to bad things, what leads to choices, what leads to decisions, and what leads to growth. So keep that in mind. We are focusing a lot on formal learning, but there's more to life, and in fact, most of life is non-formal learning, learning by living. Okay, let me start with what doesn't work. The one thing that doesn't work is what I'm doing now. Lectures just don't work. And the first av availability of data on this goes back close to 100 plus years, by the way. Every randomized study that has been done has shown that lectures don't work. And the reason lectures don't work is people can't pay attention for a very long time, number one. Number two, if you don't use what you just learned, you forget it, you'll never use it. Number three, I will be very lucky if I ask you one year from now, who came? Did you ever hear anything on learning? Two years from now, the odds are zero. Okay, and in fact, I'm gonna show you, it doesn't even take that long, about 30 days is when you're gone. No idea whether you came to the central library and you heard somebody talk about learning and who said, don't lectures work. So one of the things I'm trying to do is the first 10 minutes counts a lot more than the next, uh, uh, next 40 minutes and the last five minutes counts again. So I'm gonna focus everything a few minutes front and beginning, in the middle, if you want to take a nap, feel free to do so, okay? However, if you don't want to believe what I said about lecturing, why don't you read a bunch of articles, one of which is very popular called 20 Terrible Reasons for Lecturing from London, where this is almost 30 years old, this paper, and actually illustrates with all the studies that have been shown why it doesn't work, but more important shows why people still do it. And the biggest reason for it is habit. And by the way, why are 60 minutes? Why is, is there anything magical about 60 minutes? The only thing magical is it's an hour. That's all it is. In fact, we know perfectly well, no one can sustain attention for one hour. Okay, we know that very, very well. So, if you want to look at data and if you can measure it minute by minute, most of the retention is the first 10 minutes, a little bit in the last 10 minutes. In between, more or less zero. Very, very close, nothing happens. This is the problem, is most schools have been built like this. These kind of classrooms, by the way, were built in the 19th century for the purpose of inducing disciplined learning, which came from the Frederick, who was the king of Prussia, and he decided this was the best way to get kids to stay in place, not to talk, not to think, just do what they're told. And it worked. It was meant for the Industrial Revolution, you needed people to do work in a particular way, and it worked for the time. A small group were the elites who went to the university. Very, very tiny fraction. That has changed. Today, 30, 40% of national populations hope to get university education. The problem is two things. One, what are they gonna do after they do it? And second, are we commoditizing where we have stripped it out and made it like Frederick, and that's what this type of classrooms are. These classrooms are meant for what is called passive education, passive transmission. And we'll get into it in a second. And the problem with all this is most of us learn only if you're actively engaged. In fact, all of us learn only if you're engaged. You don't learn if you're doing this. And in fact, I would suspect most people would be doing other things while they're thinking they're taking notes in a class or whatever, because your mind is not on it. It wanders. And the reason is passive lectures don't work, doesn't engage you. So the other part that is important to keep in mind is we try to get everything crammed into the poor kids and we actually do exactly the opposite of how learning works and we'll talk about it in a minute. But the more important part is we also focus that we also don't focus enough that in the real world, people have to work in teams. You're not competing all through life. You have to figure out a way to work in groups to make things happen. What we are right now in most schools and universities is think that we have to cram as much information into somebody's head as quickly as we can and test how much of it they got three months out or four months out. You don't really seem to care, or when I say you, in general, people don't really seem to care, did they learn what you wanted them to learn and can they apply what they learned, which is really the hallmark of any learning. And this is compounded by the fact that the amount of information available now is massive. Think of it, no one's brain is going to be the equivalent of Google plus, 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 right? No way. You cannot store that kind of information. It might be all kinds of information, 
but it's storing vast amounts. What you want is the ability to find, search, apply. So let's start at the beginning. The most important thing that leads to any type of learning is motivation. And I'm not going to get into detail, but there are four components of motivation. The first is whatever you want to learn, you need to have the ability to learn that. <coughs> if you don't have the ability to learn, it's going to be a struggle, and you won't be motivated. You'll lose it. Second, you have to have a reason, a benefit. You need to say, I'm going to do medical school. I need to get my grades X, so I'm going to work hard enough to get that. That's the benefit you want by the work that you're focusing. Something we really forget is confidence. If you're not confident, you don't learn very well. Okay? But there is a caveat. If you're overconfident, you don't learn too well either. You need to be in the middle. It's a Goldilocks principle. There's something that's right in the middle. And lastly, the overall desire. If it's because you want to go to med school because your mother or father wanted you to do it, it'll get you started, but it's really not going to keep it going. It's so-called desire. Desire has to be within you. And the greater the desire within you, the more likely you're going to keep it going. Without this, there's failure. There's no motivation. It tends to come apart. Now, by the way, this is not uniquely human. All living beings, all an many animals, birds, honeybees, etc. Honeybees, by the way, are the best experimental uh, creatures to look for learning because they're built to learn. They can't survive without learning. They need to know where to go find the honey and tell every other bee where to go to find the honey. So it's a lot of communication and a lot of learning. And it's actually quite complex learning. And their brains are specifically organized to facilitate it. But these were experiments done in the 1930s. Uh, and this was called the electric grid experiment. They would put an electric grid, grid, keep rats on one side, give food on rats on the same side as it is. On the other side, they would throw something the rat hadn't seen. What the rats would do is they forget the food. They will cross the electrical grid to go get the food, even if the shocks are there. This is, if you think about it, it has to do with survival. All species tend to like to no look and explore what novel things are just to know what it is because it could be danger in the future. Our brains were built for one thing, to survive. Okay, if you think of it in that basic principle, you can start putting a lot of it together. Monkey will play with a new object introduced into its cage. Even for getting food, if you keep on throwing new things in, it tends to forget food. Very interesting. So novelty is key, but most of this kind of motivation is called intrinsic, within you. I'm assuming many of you have got kids. When they're babies, what do you see? They're exploring constantly. When they get a little older, and they learn to speak, they keep asking you questions, and finally you say, don't, don't ask me anymore, shut up, right? That's when you're squelching the intrinsic motivation. When you squelch is when you're really turning off what human beings just like anything else, is built to learn. You turn it off. And anyway, there's a lot of science underneath it, and it has an inverted U-shaped curve. And in a population, some people are more curious, more risk, and some are less. And that's probably good at a population level, too. That's what keeps uh, humankind moving forward all the time. If you're content with everything, nothing moves, by the way. Okay, so the big big driver for this and the expression of this is curiosity. Children are curious by nature. Somewhere along, we get them to be less curious because we focus too much on what they need to know rather than letting them experience, explore, and know. I was on a, watching a TED talk the other day and they were talking about who the entrepreneurs are globally. The entrepreneurs are the ones who explore, the ones who take risk, etc. And many of them are not very good in formal education, by the way. If you look at the people who create things, many, many of them are not very good in the formal thing. We actually know how the brain works on this again. I'm not getting into details, but it involves a particular neurotransmitter called dopamine. And there are some individuals, and, and this, by the way, is the same chemical that plays a role in addiction. It, how, it also plays a role in its excess in many kinds of addictive behaviors. And this brings up, if once you're motivated, the motivation drives you to select your attention to what you're interested in. If you're motivated in playing a game, tennis, you are going to try it. It focuses on it and attends to it. The fact that you came here means you're interested in learning or you came here because someone else told you to do. Either way, 
but you got here because there's some interest, something that drove you to it. That leads to attention. But attention is only the first component in the whole process because attention leads to perception. You are now observing me. You're observing me speak. You're observing me by looking at me. But your brain is actually doing something different. This whole thing of perception is not like a movie camera or video camera observing me. You're actually hearing what I'm saying, seeing what I am, and you're putting it in the context of everything else you know. So in other words, you are perceiving me based on a previous perception of what you expect it to be. And that is how our brain works. Our brain doesn't record anything. Our brain connects it to everything else that it does. But it's built or biased in a certain way to build it for what it needs, which is survival. So let me ask a question on this. You you're seeing two pictures. This and this, which one is lighter? Okay. And the reality, by the way, is both are exactly the same. Exactly the same. But what does your eye tell you? They're different. But once I tell you it is, next time you see it, you know what it is, and you will perceive it for what it is. Even though your eye tells you one thing, your brain tells you this is what it is. Grave, the contrast is what leads to it. This is another example which is even more difficult. It's actually the same spectrum, but different backgrounds. Okay? And this one is actually hard to convince yourself that they're the same. Because your brain is, your eye is saying, no, it isn't the same. It's perception. Perception means you're taking input and you have out, you also got something inside your brain which is helping you to perceive it. These are obvious ones, but I, uh, if we, we, I give another presentation on perception. If I invert your face and I put it amongst a bunch of faces and say, identify yourself, you'll have difficulty. If I take the right half of your face and the left half of your face, separate it out, the two halves put together look very different. Very hard for you to figure out again. Our brains are based to try to connect it to something you expect and know. Hearing, by the way, is the same thing. Language develops. So why do you think we get accents when we talk? It has to do with what are called phonemes, sound bits. Every language has got about 200 sound bits. And those sound bits are what the baby hears when they're very, very little. And actually what the brain develops for that baby is it only focuses on those phonemes and it tries to drop out the others because that facilitates language acquisition very fast. So when you try a new language, when you have a computer trying to disengage it, it has a hard time because the phonemes to the computer sounds exactly the same. But it's contextually processed to make it into the words that we want. Um, and if you want to try it out, you can go to a website called Why We See What We Do and play around on the website. Lots of these things are there. It gives you an idea how the brain perceives things. It's called top-down processing versus bottom-up input, okay? So this comes back to the most important thing, which has to do with forgetting. And there's the one curve I'd like you to remember. It goes back to 140, 150 years ago. This person, Ebbinghaus, experimented on himself on memory. So now, what I, remember what I told you? You remember better when you can connect it and contextualize it. What if you just learn unconnected information? How long does it remain in your brain? So if you learn it, this, and then when I test you, by 20 minutes, you can only recall 40, 50% of it. By 31 days, barely over 20%. Okay, so this is very, very striking, and it is universal. If you cannot contextualize it, cannot apply it, don't apply it, it fades out pretty fast. That's why lectures which are passive are gone. You don't keep it in your mind. However, it's been a very difficult habit to break, which gets to rules for learning, which is true whether you are kindergarten or whether you are an adult learner or whether you're working inside a job. These same rules are based on how the brain works. So let me start with the most important one is how do you develop and keep motivation? For motivation, you need to have an idea what the goals of learning are. So you need to have goals, and these goals have to be set properly, and they have to be set for the right time period and in the right way, 
And the most important element of it is goals that are vague, be good, do this, doesn't work. Goals that are very specific. If you're doing homework, I will finish so many problems by tonight. That works better. Okay, there's three parts to it. It has to be specific, it has to be concrete, and it has to be time dependent. It also has to be relevant. So one way, an acronym that is used, and is used very much in the commercial world, in the office world, is SMART. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time limited. And this is a very key way of looking at how to set goals. By the way, when you set up a new class for students, et cetera, having clear-cut goals goes a long way to know how the students, the student knows where to go. And that helps them get to those goals better than if you're sort of very vague. It used to be when I used to go to school, no one ever said what the goals were. The goals were just assumed. And in fact, it would be very hard to ask the faculty or the, or the teacher to ask what the goals were because they didn't keep it in their mind. They just knew they had to finish the curriculum. That is what's called mindless thinking. Mindful thinking is you need to know why you need to do what you need to do and what can be used and applied. And like anything else, if the goals are too hard, the student gets turned off. If the goals are too easy and too easy to achieve, it doesn't serve its purpose. It has to be right. And that is usually called the Goldilocks principle. And by the way, there's a fair amount of science that shows that the front part of the brain is a key that plays a role in making these goals work, called prefrontal region. So set explicit goals, goals give direction, measure achievement towards a goal, and you can build smart goals for almost everything you do. But goals is first step. Second step is organization. The individual has to organize themselves, which means a class, classroom, teacher, etc., have to organize to go towards a goal. So you need a cycle which includes self-discipline and, and self-regulation. What do I mean by that is, and this is actually very, very common, and you probably will see it in your children, if you say, did you study today? Yeah, I spent two hours. But actually, if you go and see, and then when they do the exams or test or whatever, and they don't do well, you ask them what happened. I studied, I just didn't do well. But if you actually go and ask them, what did you do in those two hours? It is so common nowadays to see they were on Facebook, they were on this, they were listening to something else, etc. But they thought they studied because they had the book in front or whatever. The reality is, when you get people to look at what they're actually doing, then it helps them get awareness. If you get awareness, you can regulate. You can judge, and therefore you can react and make changes. Now, motivation therefore requires goals and organization to achieve the goals. But the other main step that comes up is the following. And you all know this, especially any of you who play sports knows, if you want to good at anything, you keep practicing. So practice makes perfect. Absolutely critical for any learning. So if you learn once and then say one year from my, now I need to know it, your brain is not designed for it. And the reason for it is the following. Your brain has got billions of neurons, but trillions of connections. And those connections change all the time. And they're designed to help you survive. So if you need to know something, the connections get strengthened over time. They actually physically get connect, strengthened over time. And the more you do it, those physically, physically strengthened connections persist. They take a longer time to disappear. By the way, one little tip there, if you need to do something and you want to keep it remembering a long time, a little bit of sleep after you do it plays a role. Sleep helps consolidation of that part of the process. Okay. So the other part that's actually key is not just simple repetition, but repeating things in a very deliberate fashion. Now, we're all designed, and in fact, most of you, if I ask you, would tell you, you tend to repeat things you're comfortable with. You tend to not repeat things that you're not so comfortable with. Okay, because your own internal rewards are, I'm doing better, I keep doing the same thing. Okay, that's how we're set up. But if you really want to get better at anything, and those of you, again, who know sports know this really well, you practice more of what you know less and practice less of what you know more. Exact opposite of what you intuitively feel, okay? So it's practice more of what you know less and practice less of what you know more. This is called deliberate practice, very well known in sports psychology for a long time and a lot of science that underneath it, which is basically on the same principle. 
Okay? If you want to strengthen things that are weak, you've got to keep repeating more of it. Okay. Which brings up the next principle, which sometimes we forget. Okay. How does our brain work, right? See, if, interestingly, when you take exams or you want to study for something, most people read, they come back, and then they read it again. Actually, your brain does a very simple thing. For it to read again, it sees it as not new. And there is something called the illusion of knowing. Illusion of knowing is your brain just turns off. I know it. It really doesn't, by the way. It just looks familiar. This has the same way the brain works, looking for always something new. So the best way to learn, and this has actually got the biggest single effect on learning, is close anything you're doing and try to recall everything you learned and write it down. It's called free recall. Recall beats repetition substantially. Single best tip you can get for doing well in the current educational system is close and learn, not open and read and read. Okay? And it's a fair amount of data, roughly 40% plus effect. The next one is actually counterintuitive. Most educational systems have been built to passing exams. Exams are actually tests of aptitude. They test really how good you are. They don't, they're not really designed to test to make you competent. Okay, so let me get at it in a second. So how do you normally learn for an exam? You just learn just before the exam, and that does work. How long do you think it lasts after the exam? It's gone, very fast, disappears. Total waste of the educational system and for you, by the way. But that's the nature of it. We all built this long, long ago. People forgot why they built it that way. They, by the way, didn't build it that way. It just went that way as you commoditize things. What you really need is to space the learning. So if you want to remember something very long time, remember you go back to Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. When you're just beginning to forget, if you go back and recall and relearn, you remember a longer time. Each time when you're just beginning to forget, it lengthens out. You can go further and further with recall. So they tried this out on 3,000 kids in Iowa, randomized one group versus the other group, and they showed the effect was very, very powerful. This type of learning, psychologists call spaced learning, okay? And the learning that happens just before an exam is called masked learning or cramming. Cramming works short-term, spaced learning works long-term, and long-term learning is what you really need, not cramming. However, the one thing that when I always show people like, especially students, is if I need to cram, for an exam which is 90 days from now, what should be my schedule? So this is the schedule based on looking at 1,500 odd individuals. If it is something that you're not so good at, your learning interval is 10% of the time that it reaches, that you need to take the exam. 90 days out, every nine days. Something you're more familiar, up to 30%. You will know when your curve falls, so what, up to 30%, okay? This is like trying to fit to the current systems. It's maximizing the efficiency of learning. Okay, which brings up the next one. Again, goes back to sports. A lot of this, by the way, is applied in sports, professional sports in particular, because they've learned it not so much from the science, but by doing it. What is meant by interleaving or mixing it up? If you want to play any game very well, you've got to play the game. If you're going to play tennis, just getting very good at forehand and not at uh, Backhand is not going to serve you very well. To play the whole means you're mixing it up. So when you start any activity, you can start it in isolation. But if you want to get good at it, you've got to mix it to the way it really is. And that's called interleaving or mixing it up. Now, very, very pertinent to schoolwork. Most schools, and I suspect it can't be any different in Hong Kong, they tend to go in what I would call a linear curriculum. You did Algebra one way, and you do the next step in algebra, then you go to this, etc. What people do, therefore, is know how to do each one okay, but they haven't figured out when, why, and what to do. So the way you figure it out, and the way these systems are now being built for math classes in particular, is to try to get you to use what you learned before into what you're now learning. So in other words, you're mixing up problems from different topics, and that forces you to choose which solution, which method do you need to use to solve those problems? So it's gone 
to one order above, which is learning to think to apply, which gets back to problem solving, which is the most critical element in today's world. Whereas you can probably do pretty well by taking what you would call sequential tests, when it, you may not do so well in the final exams, especially if they mix everything up. And most final exams do mix it up. So even for today's world, trying to mix it up does help your learning get better. But for the tomorrow's world, it's essential you do it because everything in life is not going to be what is in a textbook topic by topic. And this is not just math. I'm just using math as an example. It's almost any subject you want to learn. And this basically means holistic training. Sooner or not later, you have to get off the training wheels on anything you do and move to the real wheels. So real wheel is really when you get to work or when you're starting to do whatever you need to do. That's when the real wheel happens. And the sooner you can get to it, the better you are. Now, one word on tips to remember, which will get back to other things. I told you earlier, the brain works by connecting. Anything you want to remember, mnemonics, all those are based on the same principle. But there are three elements to it. If you want to remember more, anything bizarre, anything dynamic and moving, and anything odd, anything funny, all those things which are novel, help you remember. So if you want to re remember a sequence of objects, sequence of people, sequence of names, think something funny between one person and the other. Should, should definitely not be what is real. You will remember better. Somebody swallowing somebody else, somebody doing something odd. Dynamic, moving, fast, funny, and odd, all those things. Anything novel plays a role in better memory. All the mnemonic ping things that people do, every one of them is based on that same principle, which gets to one other thing with mnemonics. I think mnemonics are great and are still good for exams, etc. But the real world, it isn't mnemonics that's most important. But I know you're still in the world where we have to get to, through those exams. So we want to do it as a simple tip. If you want to remember numbers, it's called the link system. The link basically means give each number a particular object, a particular character. Keep that your list, and that list can be configured in any way. Okay, that's a simple tip. It's called the link method. Okay, now comes to exam and testing. It almost makes me think that I'm saying exams are bad. Actually, exams are great. However, exams are nothing more than recall tests. If you do deliberate recall over and over, you learn well. And those are called formative assessments. So the tool itself of testing is your learning method. It isn't the assessment method. Unfortunately, that, by the way, that's how they were sort of developed. Sooner or later, they became what has become a quick way of assessing 1,000 people and then putting them on a curve. That's nothing more than an aptitude curve. If you're already good coming in, you're going to be good going out. What you, as a class or a school, doesn't know is what did you do in between to shift somebody from wherever they are to another level, which is really what you want, where you want the top, no longer just the top 1%, but the bulk of the group to do well. So also, if you're teaching, if you're just doing it one way, it doesn't work. Anything you use, more modes of teaching, it works. Concept learning works. And two other con components of that is anytime you need to learn something, simple tip, connect it to something you already know by elaborating on it. Think of all the ways that you just, what you learned connects to what you already know. Try figuring out connections. Just making you think about it plays a huge role. Another simpler technique, which won't work for everything, is called self-explanation, especially if it's a concept you're new to. Sit down, close the book, and try to rewrite it in your own words how it works. It's explaining to yourself. That tends to help. Equally important, if you can, learn with friends. You've got Facebook, you've got so many modes of doing it. Learning with friends is more powerful than learning with somebody like me sitting in front of you. So the vocabulary we use is somebody like me doing what I'm doing is called sage on the stage. What you really want is a guide on the side. And real learning always comes with a guide on the side, always has. But it's very clear that that's the best way to learn. And by the way, friends help you learn better because you're explaining to somebody, they're explaining to you. Every time you explain, your ability to understand and extend and elaborate goes up. 
the biggest learning point is be like a child. Curiosity-based experiential learning remains the best way to learn for long term. Unfortunately, this has been one of the few things that science is very tough to study because some people are, some people aren't, and we haven't figured out a way to continue to do it, except we know what not to do. Exactly what not to do is don't say no. Ask people to continue to ask questions. Encourage questions. We know all that works. What doesn't work is say, shut up, don't ask questions, sit quiet. Everything we usually tell little kids, sit quiet, don't move, don't touch, don't do. The word don't, no and don't, play too big a role in squelching it. Obviously, you need safety, but beyond that, you've got to figure out a way to encourage them. A uh, couple of little tips, highlighting. You, I don't know how much people in Hong Kong do highlighting, but if somebody highlights, uh, the, if, you, if you highlight a book yourself, you actually learn less. If somebody has, knows the subject well, highlighted what you need to look at, you actually learn better. It just has to do with your brain tends to highlight more because you don't know. And therefore, you actually lose the point of highlighting. And also summing it up at the very end of anything you do helps a lot. These are videotapes uh, that are on YouTube from the school that shows you how some of these principles works. But the principle we did was we took all those rules. And by the way, when I worked at Duke and I ran the department, we actually worked on a lot of the science underneath it, but we never applied it. Actually, we never thought of applying it, which is interesting. And the reason for it is we're so involved in the research, we're trying to figure things out, we never connected it to what we were actually doing in our own setting. So when I came to Singapore, there were a couple of people that I was working with who were really keen on trying it out. And that's what led to this. It's called Learn, Engage, Apply, and Develop. It's the core elements of learning. We call it Team Lead because the teamwork helps you learn this better. So exactly what do we do? So first, we have no lectures like what I'm doing. And you heard me right, we have no lectures. That is a waste of time for us, the faculty. It's also a waste of time for the student sitting in a classroom. We would rather use the time differently. So what do we do? Everything we need the student to know is produced beforehand. They can be voice annotated PowerPoints. They can be web-based lectures. They can be fixed material. They can be video lectures. Or you can point them where they need to go to learn what they need to learn. And you're talking about a fairly complex area of learning, medicine. Okay, It's not like anything simple. One of the interesting things that has happened in the last 10 years is the amount of material that are on the web of very high quality is exponential. It's growing exponentially. So you can literally find even obscure topics, the best persons producing content. So content has become cheap, low cost, easily available. What used to be people wanting money, now it's all free. Very hard for any university, any university lecturer to compete against content production. You, won't, you therefore can go after best of breed content and that's what we do. We actually have a site where we load everything. It's called Gateway to Learning and you can look it up. And basically the content is loaded in this form. The, these are PowerPoint presentations, but every PowerPoint is linked to an annotation. So if you're a student and you sort of very well know this and you want to come back and look at it, you don't need to go look at that. You can go look at whatever you're interested in. So it's completely editable, meaning if this slide is no longer relevant, it can be taken out and replaced with the new content. So you don't have to redo anything. Okay. That is content production. This is the gateway. And so somebody doing a lecture can do it in front of their laptop. It takes them the same time it takes to give a lecture every year. And it's just uploaded automatically. It doesn't require... A a lot of work. In fact, almost no IT. And by the way, if you're doing school things, Khan Academy and others are producing enormously high quality content out there. So if you want to do, by the way, biology, and I don't know if biology is taught in part of the university, but if you are, there are websites produced in a small town in Montana by one teacher, and he produces content that my medical school faculty can't produce. Okay, it tells you the way the world is going. It's highly distributed. You got some really talented people creating content. So content is therefore made available to the students the day they walk in. They get a curriculum, but the curriculum has got goals. And the goals say this is what you need to know when, where, what we're going to test you with. So when they come to class, uh, so this is what really happens in a traditional education system. 
We usually say tomorrow you're going to learn subject X. And maybe you'll give them some reading material. Then you say come to class and you actually think that's when they're learning. And then you do give them a homework and then at some point you do a test. The reality is no one ever reads any pre-material. You all know that. And when they come to class, they're doing other things. PowerPoint, uh, Facebook, texting, whatever. You all know that. And in fact, in the US, it's very, very typical to see classrooms look empty because there's one student taping the whole thing and making it available to all his friends. Okay, we, are, we actually see it because when there are 500 kids in the classroom, nobody knows who came and who went. And then you think they're gonna study afterwards. The reality is they don't, this is all they do, study just before the exam. And I don't think Hong Kong would be any different from anybody else, is my guess. Okay, so what we do is all content is moved before you come to class. Class is the time when you are tested and you're tested on what you know and how to solve problems with what you know. And obviously you're taught to review before you're finally tested again. And so it's called learn, engage, apply, develop. And this is how our classroom looks. When they walk into the class, there's a timer here. The questions crop up on the screen or, in, or they're given to them in a handout, one of the two ways. They fill it out. The, this is how it looks like with a clicker or and nowadays we use a cell phone. Every student's cell phone is connected to it. And the faculty immediately know which student did well, which student didn't, but equally important, was there a topic that all the students had difficulty with? Now we don't stop there. We don't give them the answers. We give them groups. Now they have to retake the same test by teaching each other. Why do we do that? We actually find that even the best student only gets maybe 75 to 80% right, because that's the level of difficulty we set it at. What we want them is one or two students in that group probably knows the answer for the ones that the other students didn't know. And we want a 95% to 100% by from the group as a whole. And what we find is the students very soon learn that the guy who talks the most may not know. So if they listen to him, their grades, by the way, everything is graded. This is all high stakes from the time you walk in. So motivation is high. You can't come in and say, I went to a party last night and I forgot. Your grade goes down immediately and you know it immediately. Immediate feedback is the strongest motivator. Feeding some, taking an exam and giving it three months later, one month later, absolute waste. No one knew what the test was, they don't remember it and it has no value, zero value. Unfortunately, university systems around the globe were built that way. Okay, so groups, they learn together, they retake it, and they retake it by using a scratch-off system. And all of you have seen scratch-off things for your lottery tickets and all that, right? It's the same scratch-off. The more they scratch off, the lower the grade. So they very quickly learn to work as a group. They learn who talks more doesn't necessarily mean he, needs, he knows more. They actually learn to figure out pretty quickly, in this topic, in this element, this kid knows more than the others do. They tend to learn to trust each other and collaborate, which is the real world. That's our intent. The intent here is to learn, but the intent here is also to learn as a group and peer learning, to work together as a group. And there's peer assessment. They are, one of the worry about these things is one or two kids can remain silent and get through. They can't, because the other students are strongly encouraged, and in fact, there's a faculty watching to see if somebody's not interacting. We can tell. And we'll tell it again afterwards in another format. Uh, and the faculty is, is the guide. He's sitting on the side, doesn't, if a student asks for an answer, there's no explanation given by faculty. Faculty's role is to ask more questions. No answers, more questions. What they then do is we give a complex problem, and I didn't explain it too much earlier in the morning, but the complex problem has two elements to it. It doesn't have a clean answer. And the second element is Google will not give you the answer. It's open net, open book. You as a group of eight have to come up with an answer to this and you have to defend the answer. So you got people for the same question giving one answer, another one, I don't know if there's a third one, uh, third one. Each of them now can be randomly drawn on by the faculty to explain why they're right and the other one is wrong. 
It's forces and articulation and a communication, negotiation, and persuasion, all of which are essential elements in any type of learning, but very important in medicine, which is all team-based now. You never work with a single doctor, it's teams of doctors. What we find is the learning curve grows exponentially because they are taking what they learned, they're learning to be able to go look and find additional things and learning to apply it. And our students did better than students coming in with a higher entry point in the US. That led to the US adopting what we're doing. So the same classrooms have been rebuilt in North Carolina. And it's now extended into other undergraduate courses, physics, biology, economics, et cetera. So the other piece is concentration is very short, 10 minutes. So everything we produce content-wise is 10 minutes. Each slide is about 90 seconds. One of the things we interestingly found is if we tell faculty, you, you've been giving this lecture for one hour, I want you to give the same content, but absolutely clear in 10 minutes, they do it. People expand the content of a lecture to fit the time you give them. We've always known it, but it became pretty explicit once we experimented with it. Which also gets to the fact that uh, you get all kinds of new things coming in. Driverless cars, driverless planes, drones, etc. Think of how many things large, complex, integrated computing systems are going to replace. So therefore, the skills that I talked about at the very beginning become absolutely critical. And the world of education has to change to meet with it. And so these include learning to use data, learning to communicate, learning to read people, learning to apply, learning through life, and most important, learning to learn, which is what I've been talking to you about. And the most important part of learning to learn is curiosity. Curiosity means questions. Questions means these things. Why, what, how, where, and one thing which you often forget is what if. The big thing in this world is what we know is a very tiny fraction of what we don't know. More important, the known unknowns are a tiny fraction of the unknown unknowns. Keeps us very humble. So question that always comes up is you did it in a medical school, can you do it elsewhere? The answer is, the way we actually, I started writing articles in the newspaper to get the public engaged in it. And school teachers approached us, and one particular school teacher wanted to apply it in the Singapore system for kids who have difficulty with learning math. And this was done at Spectra School, and again, I don't know if I can play it here. Can I? You can? Okay. So somebody might want to make sure. Can you connect me to... Chrome or Google and I'll get onto the website. Uh, no, just connect me to Google. It's easier to do it from there. This, by the way, is a platform that we run. And this is a school called Spectra in the uh, northern part of Singapore. And it's under the campus, right? So let me show you what the kids are doing. Good day and welcome to Spectra Secondary School. As you proceed to watch this video presentation,
So anyway, I'm saying just uh, the kids in the school are explaining how it works for them to map. So this is just to show that a single teacher without any additional resources is able to do this. And most importantly, he got the kids very excited. And what he found was they moved very fast up the learning curve for math, even though they didn't like math <laughs> to begin with. Second thing which he actually found was the Minister for Education in Singapore decided to just visit and see what was happening. It was so different from, the kids ignored the minister. He walked into the room, they didn't even bother to look up or say anything, they kept learning. And that was the first time he had ever experienced it. And he was talking about how this was something that he wanted to do with more. And interestingly, there were a couple of kids who, especially one, was super smart in math. But I think the school work was so boring, he was failing. <laughs> He just didn't bother. And that came up in this context. Is it working? Yeah. Need a lot of people? Um, actually, we are doing Anyway, if you want to see it, you can also see it on the website. So to summarize, really what I'm talking about is if you want to learn, you need to know where you're going. So if you don't have a way to go, you're not going to go there. Whether you're a class, whether you're an individual, whether you're a school, university, any organization. Second is you need to know uh, how to get there, which is a map. And the map means the big goal and little goals and the direction to get there. The next step is you've got to organize yourself to get there. So once you do it, the key learning principle is how the brain works. Number one, practice. Nico. Practice more. Practice more of what you know less is the number two, and practice less of what you know more. The next one I can do more. is if you can, space your learning. If you want long-term learning, you just need to follow oh. for an exam. Cramming will work OK. Next one. The more you mix it up, the longer you'll retain it. Next, recall works better than rereading. Mix, then the, la the next couple of ones is learning works by linking, by elaboration, self-explanation, connecting, concept maps, and mnemonics, which are also based on linking, all work to help you learn. And finally, yeah, and finally, I think the other key principle. Good day and welcome to Spectra Secondary School. As you proceed to watch this video presentation, I hope you will get a sense of the way in which a student will learn maths in our school. The school uses the team-based learning approach to help me learn maths. This approach allows me to be self-directed and regulated in my learning and I decide on the pace which I am comfortable in learning. The lessons are also very authentic and I'm now able to understand how important and relevant Max is to the real world. Rather than listening to a teacher in class, I get to watch the video lessons online. The school will be providing each of us with a surface tablet so we will be able to assess the online videos anytime and anywhere of our choosing. Having watched the videos at home, we come to class and engage in meaningful and collaborative learning. We work with peers to help each other complete exercises in class. And if we still can't solve our problem, our teacher is at hand to help us. Through this process, I receive immediate feedback through the interaction with my peers, as well as the teacher who will have information of my learning through technology. He is then able to give me quality feedback. I usually receive two or three weeks worth of lessons ahead of time and I'm given total autonomy to video contents at my own pace and comfort. The video lessons relevant to the learning of a specific topic is mapped out completely and I will either be watching videos from the Khan Academy as well as a dedicated local Max content provider. Even if a teacher falls ill and he's not in class, I know what I have to cover and with my surface tablet, I can tap on the school Wi-Fi and view the lessons that I have to watch. As I watch the video lesson, 
I will have this viewing guide and I know what to look out for. I will then have to update the re relevant information on the guide. In a normal situation, if I was not attentive or miss out what the teacher has said, I will not be able to rewind the teacher. However, with a video available online, I'm able to rewind the video many times over until I'm confident of understanding the concept. And if I still do not understand the concept, I'm encouraged to write down any question and ask the teacher when I come to class. These are 11 year olds. As I'm now in charge of my learning, the teacher assesses my learning based on the school values, which is respect, responsibility and resilience. For instance, if this, we are also able learning. to track the exact question and the response given uh, by a lot the student. Of this can be and you can decide In this case, I can go anywhere on this the side. student's response for the parameter of the figure is 41 units. Which you was don't need to get into examples, but it shows you on a lot of what inspection, they do. you will notice that the number of squares shown on the figure is 41. This is the most important and thing. And hence, the student had. Is what the process involves an individual test, feedback, after which the students get into very, teams very well. and they deliberate over the same set of questions. They use this form called the Immediate Feedback Assessment Technique, IFAT for short, to help them determine if their selection is correct. The answers are set in multiple choice format. And once the students agree on their response, they will scratch a civil call over the selected box. In the first question, this form of assessment is much more efficient than the traditional test, where students only realize the correct answers after the teacher has marked and returned their test paper several days later. The immediate feedback is so much more superior to the usual delayed feedback. Moreover, it doesn't just assess. It's a learning process, and students finish the assessment knowing the correct answer. This is typically the assessment plan for each. This is just to show you the actual videos that One happens in the class. One. Okay. That if you come and go in and out of the class, they ignore you totally. So this is the most important work, which is you engage, you learn. You don't engage, you don't learn. And that is the key thing that drives the whole cycle. So we have about 125 school teachers now training. And the government there is gradually, the key here is not for that 1%, 2% really smart kids. They're going to learn anyway. It's for the bulk. How do you help them learn? And the key is competency learning, not just aggregate testing. And that's the focus. You see, I write You see the Singapore accent. A thumb to A. So the entire curriculum framework is this now is trying to be spectra built around this framework. system. This is Singapore and we hope approach. that through our teaching process, our students will be confident, engaged, responsible, resilient, and respectful students. We are confident that our approach will help students achieve academic success. And more importantly, we will help develop the 21st century competency skills that our students will require, such as team learning, a caring and confident outlook, and being a responsible citizen. Lastly, our students will be learning how to learn.
these students come in a lower entry and are doing better than students coming at a higher entry. And that meant uh, the American Association of Medical Colleges basically wrote a report on it, and it's online, talking about how the framework could be a path for future learning. So thank you, Open, for questions. Um, so uh, thank you, Professor Krishnan, for the insightful talk. So uh, any guests have any questions, thoughts, comments? Um, please feel free to share here. Yes, please. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I really appreciate what you present, and your presentation is very in like very psychology, connective way to learn. And uh, I want to show you my concern and see if you have any thoughts. Is that um, what you show in the video? That's what I'm doing in the education system. Is that you know I have a group of kids where I engage them, and normally they have question and. My role is not giving them question. My role is just engage them, student, and to explore uh, what's the answer. And sometimes the question go bigger and bigger, and actually they learn more. You know, they they try to learn what is water, what does that consist, C CO two, something like that. They and all of a sudden they talk about aliens and stuff like that, which they learn. Um, but my concern is that when I realize you talk a lot about curiosity, and my personal experience is that because uh, the education system has cut a lot of uh, art, like I'm talking about music, uh, visual, <coughs> visual art and performing arts, and that stopped kids from um, exploring knowledge. And that's one of my biggest concerns. And second is that um, even though I have that, uh, that group setting learning, uh, parents, has become a struggle because um, they have a habit of, you know, testing, uh, you know, that kind of tradition learning experience, which becomes a habit and becomes a community tradition. It's really hard to break. And um, I don't know. I just want to. So see the first one is actually absolutely right. If you want to get creativity going in any class, those kind of activities are amongst the best. Art, collaborative art painting murals, doing things together, uh, all those things end up because it gets to what I talked about earlier. That one requires not just focused attention, but the ability